But let me start by telling you three stories. In 1995, a 30-year-old British single mother was jobless and penniless, relying on welfare to put food on the table. Unable to find a job, she spent most of her time in small cafes, writing a book about wizards and spells and magic. The story was merely a product of her imagination, but she was convinced that it would win the hearts of young boys and girls around the world. Clinging onto that hope, she pushed and pushed and pushed to get it published. Without any luck. She even wrote under a male pen name in a bid to force it through. But she was told no. And not by one publisher. Not by two, not by three, not by five, not by ten. But by twelve different publishers. One of them even wrote her a scathing letter telling her that she should take writing classes. The woman's name? Joanne Rowling. In 1976, a 21-year-old man decided that he wanted to build a new computer. Fresh out of university, he was inexperienced and had little knowledge of the entrepreneurial landscape. He had barely any money and no connections. He used to spend hours in his garage or his kitchen assembling parts and then desperately calling investors, pleading for their interest. He splashed $1,500 in parts for an unproven product, which was an unimaginably large amount of money at the time. Ultimately, though, it started a period of sustained success where this young man remarkably spearheaded unparalleled invention after unparalleled invention where each new item was quirkier than the one before it. He introduced features that the world had never seen or even dreamt of. That man was Steve Jobs. An 86-year-old businessman from Nebraska has on numerous occasions stated that he rarely conducts meticulous research into companies before investing in them. He has never relied heavily on quantitative screening tools. Instead, he simply gravitates towards those businesses he finds interesting and fascinating. As reckless as that approach may seem, it has made Warren Buffett the fourth richest man on the planet. All three of these individuals came from different backgrounds, grew up in different environments, and had different experiences on their path to the top. The common denominator was their willingness to listen to their instinct and allow their intuition to guide them. It was a universal consensus that Rowling's novel was terrible. But she continued to push on because a little voice inside her head told her that it would be a hit. Steve Jobs not only had the most audacious and strangest ideas, but also the courage to put them into practice. Warren Buffett frequently threw his money into places that the numbers and facts advised against saying that a sixth sense told him to be fearful when others were greedy, and greedy when others were, fe were fearful. In a world that has changed, and will always continue to change, such individuals remind us that intuition remains one of our best guidance tools. We have forgotten that our intuition has the power to create real change, if, like Buffett, like Rowling, and like Jobs, we are brave enough to listen to it and trust it. I guess that begs the question, what is intuition? In a nutshell, it is the mind's ability to produce answers or solutions to problems without an explicit rationale. Where logical reasoning involves a series of considered coherent steps to reach a conclusion, intuition is not a deliberative thought process. If I were to give you a complex mathematics problem, you would provide me with the clear working to demonstrate your understanding and show me exactly what was going through your head as you were solving the problem. Let's consider a slightly different scenario, though. If I were sitting next to you at the NRL Grand Final and asked you to predict the outcome, you would give me an answer straight away, without thinking twice. Even if the game was held at a neutral venue, even if the numbers suggested that the teams were evenly matched, and even if the experts were divided, chances are that you would have an opinion. Some, if not most of you, would be very, very confident in that opinion. But this time, if I were to ask you why, 
you probably wouldn't be able to give me a strong justification. In fact, you'd struggle to articulate your thinking. In that sense, I like to define intuition as a decision-making method which lacks awareness of a definite thought process and does not require effort to apply. So if our intuition has nothing to do with the deliberate analysis and combination of information, where does it actually come from? Contrary to popular belief, the answer is not thin air. Our instinct or intuition can be, def uh, can be conceptualized as an advanced form of pattern recognition conducted on a subconscious level. That is to say, our brain has a habit of forming associations between past experiences and current circumstances, even if those past experiences aren't fresh in our memory. Albert Einstein once said that intuition is nothing but the product of earlier intellectual experience. The reason that those decisions feel instantaneous, feel spontaneous, feel effortless, is because they are based primarily on recognition. To illustrate this point, Dutch psychologist Adrian de Groot points to the ability of skilled chess players to rapidly identify promising moves. An experienced player who has faced thousands of different scenarios in previous games can subconsciously use these memories to pattern match, even though they can't actively recall every one of those scenarios. The brain of a novice, however, has not been cataloguing information over such a long period of time, and that's why they may struggle to run these mental simulations. Interestingly, it is believed that intuition is a very primitive trait that exists in most animals. For species that don't study economics and don't know how to conduct a cost-benefit analysis, and for species that simply aren't intelligent enough to consciously think of ways to solve problems, a reliance on instinct is the only way to survive. If a zebra hears a faint rustle in the bushes, it will bolt, because the last time that happened, its best friend got eaten by a lion. In a slightly more pleasant example, if I give my dog a treat, he will eat it without batting an eye, because the last time I gave him something edible, it tasted really, really good. Humans are rather different. Countless times in her career, Oprah Winfrey suggested that we have forgotten how to listen to our intuition because of our capacity to think deeply and to rationalize. That's what we understand, that's what we can put into words, and that's what makes us comfortable. If, in 1976, you would ask Ronald Wayne why he sold his 10% share in Apple for $800, he would have shown you a plethora of graphs, tables, numbers and statistics to conclusively prove to you that Apple was going to fail. He would have told you that Steve Jobs' decision to splash $1,500 on an unproven product was reckless and a recipe for disaster. Since then, the value of that stake has increased slightly to $35 billion. As the most intelligent species on the planet, we have both rationality and intuition at our disposal. The reality is that we no longer listen to our instinct because we like to be in control. We like being backed up by facts and figures. We like being able to justify our decisions, not by using what we know, but by using what we know we know. In fact, only 20% of the brain's gray matter stores conscious thoughts, while the other 80% is dedicated to subconscious thoughts. From a cultural perspective, society, <clears throat> excuse me, society tells us to have a long, hard think before making important decisions, to make the most of every available resource in order to reach an informed conclusion. But very few people realize that when you use your instinct, when you use your intuition, you are actually doing a lot more thinking than you're aware of. At the end of the day, though, when all said and done, the most important question in this speech is whether or not intuition still holds a place in a world where we have so much access to information, education, and cold hard facts, where stock market behavior can be predicted with surprising accuracy where producers know exactly what consumers desire, where Google allows us to read up on almost everything known to humankind. Does intuition still hold relevance in that world? 
I was skeptical for a long time, but ultimately it was individuals like Buffett and like Rowling who convinced me that the answer is yes. It absolutely does. Three reasons stand out. Firstly, intuition is the mother of innovation. The human intellect is constrained and driven by pragmatism. Rationality involves using what we already know and what is already available to us. The contributions of the world's most creative people, our Mark Zuckerbergs and Henry Fords, came from a willingness to do things that didn't always make sense at the time. Ford once stated, if I had asked the people what they wanted, they would have just told me, faster horses. With logic and reasoning, we can work wonders within the boundaries of the known. But with intuition, we can expand those boundaries. Whether that be from atoms to molecules, from computers to mobile phones and iPads, or from Earth to the farthest corners of the universe. Secondly, it is worth noting that the associations our subconscious mind forms between the past and the present are not tied to outcomes, but the way we feel, which means your instinct will tell you to do whatever gives you joy and fulfillment. That's why people rarely regret following their instinct, even if things go wrong along the way. For example, I know I speak on behalf of many of the senior students in our room when I say that choosing six subjects to study in years 11 and 12 was a big challenge. We pondered for hours on end, thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of each course. What university degree will I be eligible for? What skills will I develop? How much homework will I get? Even after answering these questions, it is likely that many of you were still undecided and reached the point where you had to choose one of two or three options. Even though those options seemed inseparable at the time, you probably did make the right choice and put more thought into your decision than you were aware of. Thirdly, the more you use your intuition, the better it gets. Sometimes it does lead us down the wrong path, but the more experiences we feed our brain, the stronger our subconscious memory bank becomes. Ultimately, the point of this talk was not to tell you to stop using your brain and rely solely on an inner voice. Instead, it was to show you that intuition can be a powerful and reliable tool which, if used well, has the power to create real change. I think Albert Einstein, a champion of intellect, rationality and logical reasoning, phrased it perfectly when he said that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind a faithful servant. We have created a society which honours the servant and has forgotten the gift. Thank you.